got pretty much everyone here who has signed up, so that's awesome. Um, I'm Dave Bressler. I think everyone knows me. Um, Paul Wilson is here. He has been helping a lot with these uh, group meetings and um, is pretty experienced at this point with a lot of the stuff we're doing. Um, certainly, I think he would be open to folks coming to him for sort of guidance um, here and potentially otherwise in this general region up here. You've got how many stations out at this point? Seven. Seven. So, um, and then we have Bob Heil here, who is uh, with Broadhead um, Watershed Association. And he's gonna just sort of introduce the facility here in Broadhead. Sure. Well, thanks guys, and thanks everybody for coming. So my name is Bob Heil. I'm executive director of Broadhead Watershed Association. And welcome to our beautiful new building, because this is a new building. Uh, we moved in here 11 months ago. This building is owned by Stroud Township, and we have like a 25-year lease. Uh, we are here as this Pocono Heritage Land Trust. So we're both cluster partners, for those of you who work in the clusters and understand the whole DRWI process. So these are, our offices are back here. So under housekeeping type of stuff, First of all, this is exactly why this building in this room was built. It was envisioned that we would have meetings here for the general community, for public outreach, as well as very specific meetings like this uh, for environmental groups, environmental professionals to do training. So you're fulfilling the mission of the building <laughs> by being here today. Um, we have a small kitchen that was really designed for staff purposes, but everybody's welcome to use it. Um, also in this hallway are restrooms, uh, of course, use those. And everything we have here we want you to use and, and make it your day. So I'm going to mostly disappear, but I'll be here to help David and Paul as much as you can. Um, the Broadhead Watershed covers half of Monroe County, about 300 square miles. The Broadhead Creek is right down along the edge of the property. And ultimately that creek flows into the Delaware River just north of the Delaware Water Gap. As a watershed association, we are small staffed. I'm the full-time executive director. I have three part-time employees that do specific uh, roles, and we re rely on a lot of volunteers to do a lot of stuff. Um, so, um, I was just, some thoughts went through my mind. I know many of you were at the CDRW conference the last two days, as was I. And um, when, uh, towards the end, there was a section on volunteers, master watershed stewards. And when David posted the uh, attendance list, I was really happy to see a lot of uh, master watershed stewards because I think that's a really good match for the Mayfly Station program. The master watershed stewards provide you with enough technical information um, that you're really comfortable with this Mayfly Station. And if, if we take someone who's just a well-meaning volunteer who has no background at all, I fear that they would struggle with Mayfly stations. So the Mayfly stations here in our watershed, uh, Paul Wilson has some on the Broadhead, there's one up in the Paradise sub-watershed, there's a bunch of them in Cherry Creek. So they are scientifically important, and I have a biology degree, I could get really nerdy and, and get into this all day, but I won't today. And, but from a watershed perspective, I think it's gonna help us tell a story that we're gonna be able to tell a story that there are monitors out there, it gets the citizens involved, or, or thinking that you know there is a measurement of the water quality in our, in our area, and we're, we're watching that, it's working towards the big picture thing. So I'm just really happy you're here. Uh, we have brochures out here if you wanna learn about Broadhead Watershed. This little room is a museum area. On your breaks, take advantage of it. Um, if it ends up being a nice day, you want to take a walk, take a walk. Um, any way I can help you, I will, but I'll let you get on with your class. And you guys know where to find me. Good. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Bob. Thanks. 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 So, uh, one of the things we're going to be ta uh, talking about today is these, um, in my updates, we're going to touch on the fact that Shannon and Rachel, Shannon Hicks and Rachel Johnson are going around the basin updating these stations with 4G sending directly to monitor my watershed. Um, Shannon's actually going out to one of Bob's stations 
uh, Forest Hill Run today and upgrading that. Bob Fendelander here and uh, is the and Kathy Brown are two folks that are kind of managing that station. It's on Bob's property. So anyway, um, welcome. Glad everyone's here. As you know, this is more of a meeting than a workshop. So the intent is to just have space and time to kind of just talk about things, bring up questions. We have a few folks that want to address the group. Dave Yates going to do, talk about some of his charts and work that he's been doing. Um, and a few other folks would like to address the group with um, some specific questions. Otherwise, we're going to have time in the afternoon to just kind of network, bring up questions, discuss whatever, you know, updates need to, more discussing. Um, after I go over the updates here for a half hour or so, hopefully, I'm going to get into usage of monitor my watershed. I'm going to sit there and actually just go through, like, all the different tabs in monitor and try to just do a thorough kind of, you know, description of how it works um, for the good and the bad. There's certain quirks that I hope I can kind of point out at that time too, just so that people get a real understanding of where we're at with that. Um, Rachel, you're on this. Notes? Okay, so Rachel, we have this ongoing um, document. I will uh, share that with folks. This is a, just an ongoing notes file for these user group meetings. I'll share that with folks. This presentation, as well as I'm going to record the monitor my watershed section today, where I just kind of go through, so that'll be some sort of recorded demonstration of usage. That'll all be posted to that website that's at the top of the field visit data forms, that wiki watershed slash DRWI. So it'll be posted in that, um, in that link. Okay, so everyone got this, Wi-Fi. It's on a piece of paper somewhere around here. So there. <laughs> no one, we didn't have any tape. <laughs> okay, so here's attendees. I think pretty much everyone's here. I left George Seeds in here. George has become kind of a prominent master watershed steward in this um, effort. He and Carol Armstrong have been doing a lot of mentoring as well as uh, field, field work. It seems to do that from time to time. I hope it doesn't cut out entirely. George had to bail at the last minute. But regardless, as Bob pointed out, there's multiple master watershed stewards here. And then we've got a few folks from further south, but then we've got more so folks that are um, from up kind of more in this region. Okay. This is just, you know, we probably don't need to go through this in detail right now, but it's kind of just a rundown of the workshops and presentations that we've done in the context of these sensor stations this year. Um, starting with some of these gatherings, the Partnership for Delaware Estuary Summit back in uh, January, and then February there was the DRWI Winter Gathering. Some of you folks were involved with that, Lauren, Kim. Um, and then we've been having these management workshops. Um, Lauren, Lauren and I did a, a couple presentations at the National Water Quality Monitoring Conference in whenever that was, Lauren, March. Um, we've done <clears throat> some of these Shannon Hicks led intro to Enviro DIY workshops. We'll be doing more of those. If any, if if any of you have not attended those, that's a sort of an introduction to some of the actual coding process of the boards, as well as a tutorial on, on installation of the, of the stations. So that's kind of just an intro type thing for folks that, those, are, that, those, those uh, workshops are often folks that don't have stations and they're sort of just trying to figure out if it's something they want to be involved with. We also did the Watershed 201 workshop um, at Willistown Conservation Trust. That's the first of the 201s that we've done. Presumably we'll be doing more on different topics. Maybe it'll be 202, I don't know. We moved the, we, the next version of the 10. We did a watershed 102 this year. I'm not mentioning it here because it was more just general ecology based. Um, but the, this version we called 102, the previous ones were 101. So I don't know if we'll 
But the point being is the watershed 201s are, are going to be more specific and more focused. This one was discharging total suspended solids. So other ones we might do, um, you know, if, if anyone wants to talk about that or wants to sort of facilitate something there, you know, we could certainly probably think about that. I think we're definitely interested in having groups, you know, Lauren and I did that watershed 201 together and Yake and Wagner, the what team, were also involved with that. So it was kind of a three group deal that kind of just made that happen. So there's certainly opportunities to do collaborative workshops, especially in that context when certain folks have certain skill sets that can be kind of just communicated to the broader group. Um, so, move on. Um, just kind of some of the questions and uh, um, in the survey, what question issues you, would you like to discuss in this gathering? Monitor my watershed staff gauges. I'm going to address that here in a second. Um, data analysis. We're going to get into that um, a bit, as well as data display in the um, in the monitor my watershed. We're going to talk about upgrading the stations to the 4G network. Okay, this is the list of updates that I'm going to get through. And I'm just going to touch on these. The idea is for me to just touch on these right now. If you have additional questions about these particular things, then let's, we can just, we should have time in the afternoon to just break into small groups and just have a sort of an organic kind of discussion as needed. So staff gauges, the black staining on the turbidity sensors, these have been out for a while, so that's become an issue. It doesn't happen overnight, but when they're out a long time, it happens, and talk, we're gonna talk about that. Um, we're doing, starting to do data analyses at the Stroud Center. We have these maintenance and QC quick guides for particularly for folks that are doing field work, and just sort of, it's just basically a quick checklist of what to do in the field. Um, Master Watershed Stewards, just kind of going over what's been happening with that because they've been kind of a big group of folks that have really assisted with, with these stations. In Pennsylvania, the other states, we've been talking about getting the equivalent in the other states, in New Jersey, and um, what's the other state? Delaware? <laughs> um, in the Delaware Basin. Shannon and Rachel are going out and upgrading stations. They're really just out and about a lot right now because we have the 4G technology. We have the code down to be transmitting to monitor, so we're just going around upgrading these. Um, data transmission to monitor my watershed. And then I'm gonna sort of touch on some of this type of stuff, uploading CSV files, historic CSV files <coughs> to the website to monitor my watershed. Okay, so getting into the details, staff gauges. So one of the things we've been doing, this is something that folks can do on their own. It takes a little, it does take some DIY and potentially some communication with folks like Rachel or me. But one of the things we've been doing in streams that are this type of situation where it's a sizable stream and you have, obviously have conditions where the water gets up super high and starts ripping through there. We've started staggering the staff gauges we were putting in, in some cases, just a, like in this case, a two meter staff gauge, and that just was just oftentimes just too much resistance when it was all said and done, especially with some of the super storms that we were having there for a while. So now we're staggering one here, one on the bank, leveling with a line level between these two. There was one behind that string. Yeah, that, that, that thing is really weird. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I was really confused. Sorry, I don't know what to do with this screen. This screen is so small yeah. that yeah. Okay. it's better to just display here. But I'm yeah, sure that's not every picture is going It's essentially <laughs> two. It's two one meter segments that are level here. Okay, great. And we So this this is something that Paul started doing because he has those situations where the staff gauges just are end up being semi useless. Um, they can be a breaker bar. They, Chris and I started when we installed them. We said, and they're probably going to be ripped out. If you put them up to your sensor package, at least they'll block the wall or something. Like 
sometimes very slightly functioning. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's, it, if you guys, uh, you know, we have different levels of experience here, but staff gauges are usually, when they're done at, you know, these USGS stations and whatever, or these permanent stations of whatever sort, it's a big production of putting in a staff gauge, you know, where you're putting in, digging a hole and putting in cement and, you know, it, it, it becomes a, we could potentially do that at some time in the future, but right now it's just, this isn't that type of, that type of thing. It's a, it, it can be a huge production. Now, I mean, there is the opportunity to, in some cases, if your station happens to be near a bridge, to mount it to the bridge. But then you have to get permission and that type of thing, and we have done that in certain cases. The Bush, the Bush Kill Station up here in this in uh, East Easton, um, Lafayette College. That one is mounted to the, you know, it's in a concrete kind of enclosure area, and that's mounted to that itself. Um, but point being here, Paul started putting in these pins. So you've spray painted this type of just straight rebar. It's the same thing that we use to mount the sensors on in the, in the stream bed. So basically just spray painting this orange and then pounding it into the stream bed. And then you have this as sort of your staple reference for if this gets ripped out or if this gets ripped out, this is gonna be most stable. So it's at least for quality control, it's at least a way to go back and put these things back where they Original. You from the top of the pin to the water and to get an offset. So just like you would stream, you get an offset. So as long as it stays there, you know how to correct the rate that the sensor back gets. Yeah. We have started using wrap tape around as well because the thing is the paint does start to flake. And so, and that's something that a lot of tape you can do underwater so you can reapply it if you need to so you can always find the pin. But you want to drive them pretty deep because the idea is to stay, have a comfort down to stay below any nastiness that goes over top. So that's a great point. And, you know, it's just, it speaks to the fact that there, you know, with each of these stations, it's ideally you have at least one person who really knows the situation on a consistent basis. He's going out at least once a month and knows the situation. If the paint's coming off, then okay, we need to adjust so that we don't lose track of where this thing is. Because once it's in there, it can, if there's not paint, it can be kind of hard to find. Are you putting this around, oh, like in just certain areas? Every station. Because it's easy, honestly. I mean, it's, it's, I use the long piece the same length as you do with a sensor pod. The only difference is I drop the sucker in pretty deep. You, you don't want to go so deep that you lose it in the sediment, but you want to have it hunkered down low. And then again, you can even start now with just having bright tape or reflective tape. Don't even worry about the paint anymore, and then you can reapply it. And then you do an offset with that, the same as you do the offset with the stream gauge, and I just keep recording that. And then, if that, and because when ours go, if it's really bad, everything goes. Because if anything that's going to take out that sensor pod, it's absolutely going to take out the stream gauge. Mm -hmm. And now I'm done. Because <laughs> all that stuff you did to try to set up your rating curves for discharge, mm -hmm. you're out of luck. You just, once you have this in, you really don't want to be moving it in. Right. Primarily because of the depth thing. I mean, temperature, mm -hmm. conductivity, that yeah, wouldn't be as big an issue. But the depth, it's like if you put that back in at a different depth, then it, right. you know, it's not the end of the world, but you have to then, if you're trying to use consistent depth over time, then you're gonna to have to adjust all of those depth measurements after it was moved. What kind um, of tape what are you using? There, you can use a bunch of different depths. I mean, you can use duct tape. You can yeah. use, there's not, yeah, a number of okay. that would actually work. Yeah. 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 yeah, so again, so um, I think Krista was, Krista was actually using um, sort of like flaggy, sort of the, the elastic sort of flaggy stuff, which you tie off. And so basically, she actually found that you could kind of wrap it and then tie the bottom, and that was staying on pretty well. So using like yeah, I mean, and that's tape. that's a lot of what this is. It, you know, it's this is not a long-standing effort. This is a new effort, and we're sort of trying things and you know, failing and succeeding, and just kind of learning from it. Um, that's where how we got to the pin thing because yeah. the staff gauges, you know, they're perfectly fine at some sites indefinitely. But other sites, you put one in, I mean, geez, that we put one in at Lawrence on Ridley and literally like a couple days later, it was entirely <laughs> ripped out. And we were like, well, we're not doing that again. Oh, we did, we did do it again. And we got ripped out again. We did it twice. We did it twice. Okay, so we didn't look. Like, uh, yeah. So, so um, the black, this is a 
really nice picture showing what these things, what these turbidity sensors look like with the, that black, whatever it is, staining on here. Um, it's an oxalic acid treatment. I didn't even put that here. Um, but this is something that Shannon is doing. It's kind of a laboratory preparation. So it's not something you can just buy off the shelf. So she has a lab person, she and Rachel have a lab person at Stroud mix it up. And so they've just been kind of treating the sensors. And you can see it does a really nice job. You can see that eyeball. But the sign of that is, is that this. Kind of mold or something? It's not a, I don't think it's a mold. It's a, it's, I think it's related to, it's, it's a chemical thing. It's but it's, you know, it's, yeah, I think it's in some way probably related to some tannins in particular streams because it doesn't happen at all streams. It just happens in certain ones. Um, but Shannon should be here soon, so she may have some things to say about her ideas about it. But um, this is a really nice plot here that pretty much describes. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so this is what it looks like with the black staining. <laughs> And then once you clear it up, that's what happens. This is un. This is this is actually how it, the data appear. And the this isn't mani I, this isn't manipulated in any way. So you can see if your turbidity sensor is riding super low through storms, through times whenever it's obvious that it should be fouling. You it's know. Flat line, right? it's, basically it's a flat line. Right? It's a flat line. It's a flat line. Right. Because it, it essentially just doesn't even allow the signal to go out of the eyeball, the turbidity eyeball. Yeah. And there she is. <laughs> Shannon. Um, hi. We're just talking about the black. What's your suspicions of, to, of what it is? It's chemical of some sort, right? Presumably related in some way to tannins. I think we're well, thinking actually maybe manganese. Mm -hmm. um, we have uh, we have issue in with other sensors that have high manganese in the water, um, and when uh, you put the oxalic acid on the black stuff, actually a big purple liquid comes off, mm -hmm. and manganese if you know anything about manganese oxide, manganese manganese all that stuff, and kind of have a purple color. So we think that's kind of what it is. So if we had some chemistry person who wants to test what comes off of that, we could do it, but. Um, yeah, it seems like it only comes off with yeah, you certain things. You can imagine scrapes them off, can't you? Know? Uh, yeah, we could. I mean, yeah. well, you know, anything that we pulled out the, the PVC pipe and uh, those kind of anything, and, and same yeah. thing, go, go find yeah. the, well, the streams that have this issue and put some item in it for six months yeah. and pull it out and then sample it. And and we do have, I mean, we do have full suite samples for most of these stations. So if we made a list of the stations that had the blackening and we could sort of <coughs> see if manganese is higher in those. Yeah. The reason we saw, we think it's also manganese just because we have an optical instrument that would look at the absorption of uh, UV visible light, and um, we would look at the absorption before and after cleaning, and what you're left with is a spectrum of what was on the lens, and it kind of matches the spectrum of the manganese. So, um, or certain versions of manganese. And so um, we have an organic chemist that used to work at Stroud. Mm -hmm. And I reached out to him yesterday because I knew this question would come up today to see if he could give me an idea of what he thought it was. And I haven't heard back yet. So, okay. um, so maybe. That's maybe Anthony I'll... Often Camp at Limnotech. The Limnotech is the group that is. Anthony's sort of leading that. He's a, from a chemistry background, basically. Um, and his group at Limnotech is, are the ones who are this monitor. Whole, the monitor port, monitor my watershed portal, they're sort of the ones that are dealing with the actual infrastructure of that. Um, so, you know, I forgot, I wanted to go around the room and everyone introduce themselves. I, we didn't bring name tags, but I thought we should probably, just so that everyone kind of knows who everyone is, maybe we can just quickly go around the room and just maybe say your name and like, uh, I don't know, like, Something. <laughs> <laughs> We're here for lunch. Let's start with. Let's is start that with cats. Is that <laughs> <laughs> Say something. Something. Whatever you feel. Yeah. Something. Something. 
All right, I'm Kathy Brown. I'm doing uh, two of the sensors. Um, I'm a master watershed steward. With which group? With um, Master Watershed with Monroe County. County. Monroe County. Yeah. Okay. So Jacqueline. Yep. Yeah. Good. Hi, I'm Jacqueline Wolfheit, and I'm from uh, Center Valley, down, down the road a bit. And um, I'm a master watershed steward through the Penn State Extension, and I'm monitoring the um, Hosensack Creek, which is over kind of in the Park Hillman area. Yeah. And then um, I'm going to start doing the QC on it, which Simon and Dave are going to you know, help me out. Yeah, and you're going to, you'd like to talk oh, this yeah. afternoon about yeah. some GIS work that you're yeah, doing. I've been you wanted starting to offer do some GIS yeah. mapping, and um, I'm having fun with it. Nick? Hey, I'm Nick. I'm from uh, the Watershed Institute. I'm the GIS specialist there. We have two stations, well, we have four stations that we still got to put up our two um, in um, Aston Pink. So. Yeah, and Nick has been um, filming a lot of these meetings we've been doing, which has been super helpful. We've been posting the recordings up to that address at the top of the field visit data form. So this one, Nick's recordings today will be up. Will be posted up there. Yep. Paul? Yes, I'm Paul well. Wilson, <laughs> East Calico University. I've been to most people one way or another. Um, so we've got the seven local stations that are here. Gary? I'm Gary Gray, <clears throat> first natural watershed through the program. We've we just got one station that just got it. Yeah, and that was actually the picture on the cover slide was that a station. It, it's right at the Berks uh, Ag Center, which is where the Berks County Master Watershed Stewards uh, Group is located. And Gary also um, very proactively and um, according to, I think he knew that it, we were going to be underprepared, brought power strips. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much the first spot on the Pollens Kill where it actually like sees light. Yeah. It's like literally at pipe the stream. pool that comes oh, out of a oh. pipe. Um, but you're also actually supporting the Nature Conservancy with their station as well, which is downstream on the Pollens Kill. And uh, also in New Inn at Memory Park. Yeah. I'm Mike Stein, I'm with Broadhead Watershed Association. What's your uh, role at Broadhead? I'm on the board. You're on the board. Okay. Bob? I'm Bob Fenlander, member of Broadhead Watershed Association uh, and host of Site SL154 on the Forest Hills Mountain. Robert? <coughs> Bob Fenlander, I'm from Berks County and uh, I'm a PMS national. Aquashicola Creek. Aquashicola. Yeah. Aquashicola is one of the streams that's more in that reference type yeah, category. So it's, it's, and it's so interesting the difference in comparison. 
Paris. Uh-huh. Yeah, so that's that's great, and you know, I mean, there's this all this data collection that we're doing, but there's also this sort of like a lot of folks coming in and learning about these systems, right. as well as the broader ecology and how these systems functions function, and then you know, being able to actually communicate that information yeah. to other people. And then we plug the off the chicle too, because that's what Chris did. You use her reference. That's right. That's right. Cherry Creek is on the upper side of the bridge. And basically, Cherry Creek going one way, now the Chicago is going the other. The Cherry Creek section we're working with have been impacted in a number of different ways. That section off the Chicago hasn't. And so there's good comparisons because, I mean, they're both limestone influence, they're both lower gradient, and so they're never going to be the broad. Uh -huh. So it makes a perfect comparison. Uh -huh. And that's one thing that's helpful for a lot of you that have these pristine sites, yeah. is it provides a comparison for one that may not be perfect. So, yeah. Thanks. Lauren? I'm Lauren McGrath from the Lewistown Conservation Trust. Uh, we have four sensors, three on the headwaters of Ridley Creek and one on the headwaters of Crumb Creek. Um, so two were installed last year and two were installed this year, and the two this year haven't had much action. So hoping we get more rain to start building our rating groups. Yake? I'm Dave Yake, uh, my partner, Marion Wagner, couldn't be here today. Um, we're part of an organization which we call Watershed Hydrology Hydrological Analysis Team, or WHAT. And we support this overall effort, so I'll talk today about some of the things that we do. And all you gotta do is raise your hand, and we'll, you know, we do our best to come and help you analyze your watershed, and analyze your data, and so on and so forth. We'll see the different things that we do. Simon. Yeah, and so that station, as well as the Aquashikola stations, are both owned by uh, Wildlands Conservancy. Yeah. And so it's Master Watershed Stewards, essentially, at this point, supporting the upkeep and maintenance of those stations. So. I'm Kim Hatchadorian with the Nature Conservancy in Delaware. I run the Stream Stewards, which is a citizen science water quality monitoring program, and my volunteers are monitoring six stations in a national park in Wilmington. And where is Chuck today? I think Chuck is the one, the lone no-show. He said he was coming. He said he was coming. He was on the list. Anyway, Chuck is one of the, Chuck is part of her group, and he's one of the ones that has been kind of a point person on the, on the, the, the one station that has been talked about a whole lot in the last couple of years, which is the one that drains from the Rocky Run from the Concord Mall area, which has seen super ridiculous high uh, conductivity spikes in the winter time from road salts. So some of Kim's data from those stations have already been used for uh, interacting with the mall and John Jackson at Stroud has used some of those data in a recent publication on um, salt effects of, on bugs and stuff. John Jackson's a scientist at Stroud. Richard? I'm Rich Cavill, I'm a Master Water Steward for Berks County. I uh, maintain and QC three sensor stations in, in Oregon, Berks, and Manor Creek for the Berks County Conservation District. Yeah, and those were all recently, they were totally offline for several years and now they're transmitting. Thanks to Shannon. <laughs> So, I'm Shannon Hicks, I'm, I guess, the inventor and uh, the reason that all this stuff is turning into the topic you invested as. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so I apologize in advance that it's not the coolest, um, you know, uh, no maintenance type of device out there, but um, at least it doesn't cost many thousands of dollars like commercial ones do. So, that was our goal all along, was to make it affordable. And most of the issues that we're having.
I'm Janelle Fishbaugh. Um, I, install, I helped install uh, one of the sensors about a month ago through Trapped Unlimited. Um, on Valley Creek. On Valley Creek. Uh, I'm new to Pennsylvania. I moved up here from Maryland. Currently looking for a job, so if anybody would like a business card, that's fabulous. I just graduated with my master's degree from Johns Hopkins in environmental engineering and science. So I'm trying to network. And, and Janelle just, we went to the Valley Creek site and Janelle showed up and was working with me on doing the cross section and discharge measurements within about 35 to 45 seconds. And um, we did that and she was right into it without any training or anything. So um, a, good si a good sign, a good sign, a good sign. She can do it, she can do it. And then Rachel. So, um, moving on. Okay, so quickly, uh, with regard to, you know, when we put these stations out, the, the primary intent was to get them to groups that wanted to use them for their own research, outreach, education purposes. So Stroud was putting these out, giving these to selling, granting and selling these stations to folks that really had specific intentions for their own usage. But secondarily, it is contributing to a broad Delaware Basin-wide data set. Um, we're starting to analyze the data. Um, the first cut of that is some presentations that we're going to do at the Delaware Watershed Research Conference in November at the, at the Academy of Natural Sciences. So I'm, these are just like 15-minute presentations. I'm gonna introduce kind of the whole deal. And then Diana Oviedo, who's a um, chemist, new-ish new, new chemist at Stroud, um, is gonna talk about um, conductivity across the basin. And Mark Paypock, who's also a new, newer chemist at Stroud, is going to be talking about temperature patterns. And then those uh, presentations are essentially kind of just leading into presumably publishing some papers on just kind of a first cut of the low hanging fruit of temperature and conductivity. Um, the quick guides, they're up here at that same location. Okay, you can download them there and print them as needed. I have hard copies here if anyone needs any. I've got hard copies of the two quick guides and I've got hard copies of the field visit data sheets. So when we finish up today, if you need copies, just hard copies, just, just let me know. I've got field visits and some of these on uh, right in the rain paper too. Um, so Master Watershed Stewards, there's been two trainings that a lot of stewards have attended. The first one was specifically for Master Watershed Stewards. It was pretty well attended back in July. It was at the uh, Berks uh, Ag Center. And then the August 10th management workshop was kind of like this, where it was open to anyone, but we did a lot of uh, steward training there. So there's quite a few stewards on board. Um, and seemingly more are, be more are being trained as we speak. So presumably as we go forward, if folks have a need for support on stations, we're gonna continue to try to involve the, the stewards. Um, this is all done in coordination with the station owners, though. These stations are not owned by Stroud. They're owned by, the particular, by you know, these individual watershed groups. Um, so there's sort of a Stroud facilitation element, but ultimately the data are you know, 
that the holder of the data is intended to be the watershed group. The person re most responsible for the data is intended to be the watershed group. Excuse me, I have a yes. question on that. Uh, so just to, this is a really sort of academic question. Sure. Who, uh, who, who literally owns the data? Well, th that's who owns. I mean, the, 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 the station itself is owned, like you're on um, Hosensack. So that station is owned by, I think it's technically owned by Perky Perky Omen High School. High School yeah. So that's where Jim Coffey is right. the one who facilitated that whole thing. And so he's ultimately responsible for those data from the micro SD card. Once they go to the monitor, then it's public. And then it's kind of like, well, who, okay. at that point, it's you're making it public. Okay. So, you know, this is all sort of intended to be, be, pub to be public so kind of, yeah communication and sharing mm -hmm. of the data, mm -hmm. you know. I would cite it in some way if you're going to publish it in yeah. some way, but other than that, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, there's folks, con you know, there's folks going to, to their getting data. You don't have to be part of, you don't have to have a station to get the data. You just go on there and it's mm -hmm. totally open site. So you can go there and download all the data you want. Um, mentors. Carol Armstrong, George sees two master watershed stewards that have been involved, involved for quite some time and they've been going out and just kind of doing site assistance and helping folks along. They are actively uh, doing this and are available. Um, Krista Reeves, who has wears multiple hats, she is also available. She was Paul's student. She works at the Muscanet Kong Watershed Association and she's also a part-time technician for Stroud. And then Rachel is also available to go out and just do site assistance. Um, okay, so upgrading stations. We've mentioned this multiple times already, but we're, Shannon and Rachel are going out and upgrading the stations to 4G. So that's some of these stations that were 2G fell off, stopped transmitting. So upgrading those as well as ones like Manor Creek, which Richard is uh, taking care of. Those that were never online because it never had 2G. There's now 4G and that is available there. Um, there is an option now for all the historic data. All the historic data is not, even if you start getting 4G, the historic data are not going to be transmitted up there via that. So there's still a need to, if you want the the historic data up there, there's a need to reformat the files so that the headers are what they need to be in order to, to be accepted by the, the website. I have a bunch of slides that describe that process. Um, they'll be in the presentation. I'm probably not going to go through those slides in super detail, but there's a online directions which Rachel and I are going to modify here next week. Um, they're a little confusing. The directions I have here are, I think, more direct. Um, Bob, that's something that would apply to you if you wanted to, or, or Richard, if you guys wanted to be involved in trying to upload your files. Now, the thing I was mentioning to Bob was that this is all sort of beta testing right now, and ideally you would be able to upload a big chunk of data, but all it accepts right now is about a week of weeks worth of data. So if you've got two years of data, that's a lot of files that you need to upload. So if you have a long file of data, you're going to have to chunk it up into one week sections. So it's a perfect job for an intern. So you know, if, if anyone knows of interns that are looking for things to do, that would be a great task for someone to just get on have an intern get on it and spend a couple months just working on all these stations, just getting the historic data from all these stations, reformatting and uploading. So, we'll see. Is there enough 4G coverage? A lot of these areas are in fairly rural. A lot of stations are fairly rural. Well, I have a hard time getting 4G for my cell phone. Mm -hmm. I just, they just went to the two on Paris and Broadhead up this road a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we got enough signal there where it will work. Now, <clears throat> when you say 4G, is it also backwards compatible with 3G and also 2G or not? No, it is not. Just 4G. Yes. And uh, on your older sites that use T Mobile, are you still 
Can I have that available? If the 2G is working, we're just letting it go. Okay. <clears throat> but 4G, you have uh, an agreement with Verizon. You're using Verizon's 4G. Or AT&T. I think AT&T is actually stronger, right, it's Shannon? No, it's identical. It works with whoever, whichever carrier has the strongest signal. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. If you build one, and like we have one that's a portable unit, and if I'm standing near an AT&T tower, it will use that during this five-minute period. And then if I drive and stand next to a Verizon tower within five minutes later, Um, with that in ahead. mind, um, do you have multiple accounts with multiple different providers for data upload? In other words, if we subscribe to Verizon for my site, then you we'll won't. You will. You will subscribe to this hall. It's a. It's a particular company called Hologram. Okay. So it's done through them, and that's what Edie and uh, Bob uh, are doing right there. now. Okay. which is setting up the, the hologram account. Um, now, the one thing that Bob and I were also talking about with regard to 4G and whether it drops out or you know loses coverage, stuff like that, um, even when we do get 4G, there's potentially going to be times when, for whatever reason, that signal drops and the data aren't transmitted. It's not going to, once it gets... Uh, coverage again, it's not going to back go back and re and send all the data that it missed. So the SD card is the ultimate source of you know the most robust data set. So that's where it's just like that. The SD card data, you know, should be downloaded even if you're 4G. Our recommendation is quarterly. You know, on QC visits, just going out and downloading the SD card data and just keeping it on a in a secure spot, one secure spot where all the files are located. And that's just, you know, to that's for safety. You know, safety first. That's during the upload process if the data is corrupted, does it retry? Um so in other words, we're uploading some data and you got a signal fluctuation issue and uh, the data arrived it, and it's like corrupted. I don't know if they'll ever arrive corrupted. It just drops I don't, the package. It's then. just, it'll either go or it won't. Okay. I think is generally how it goes. Rachel, Shannon, any, any other things to say about that? And it'll try over and over, and then if it, do, it, it stops after a certain point, what's that in the code right now? No, what it does is the, the longer it wakes up, before it does anything, it looks to see what's my battery voltage. Is my battery strong enough to turn on the sensors? If it's strong enough to turn on the sensors, it takes the sensor reading. Once it gets the sensor readings and stores it on the memory card, then if the battery is okay enough to turn on the cell phone, it will turn on the cell phone module. It takes about 30 seconds to connect to the network, like when you first boot up your phone kind of thing. And after that 30 seconds, if it has a good connection, it transmits one line of code to the website, and then it hangs up. Um, so the signal wasn't 
so that's what I was going to follow up with was that this new coding, this new, uh, these upgrades that Shannon is doing, the code on the loggers is formatting the files that are going onto the SD card so that those files can be directly uploaded without any formatting to the site, mm -hmm. to the monitor. So in that case where the data cut out in transmission, you can take that file and just directly upload it to the site and it'll fill in those gaps. Now, again, it's a week at a time. So Kim, Rob, one of Kim's guys, Rob, tried to do the upload. They had theirs uh, upgraded, and he tried to upload it, and it didn't work. But I'm pretty sure it was because the file was over two weeks bit in size, and, it did, and so he's gonna have to chunk it up. It basically just means breaking it into two different files keeping the same headers. So when you go check the SD card, or the time of the SD card, would you routinely then overwrite the, the file that was sent by cell signal? I mean, you don't know it again. I wouldn't right now. I mean, oh, unless you had someone, unless you, unless you saw some obvious data gaps that you really needed to fill in, mm -hmm. I wouldn't necessarily do that right now, just because it means you're gonna have to do a lot of actual manual labor of breaking up the file. So I would just save it at this point and, and just if there's a week that cuts out, just pick out that week and upload that. Um, yeah. Ideally, ideally you could just on a quarterly basis, you could just get the file and upload it and it would just fill in any little five minute gaps that we're missing, but right now you can't do that with three months of data, so right. it's a little problematic. Right, right. Yeah, you'll always be able to do that. You'll always be able to take a six month chunk of data and throw it on there and have it all work fine. The, uh, the people who are managing the website now, they basically inherited it from another university that was managing this until last year. And so they have the same problem. There's a lot of problems and issues, and the people who design the whole database and the whole program don't, uh, aren't working with it anymore. So they receive basically a really complicated data system that handles about a half million data points a day. Mm -hmm. And so they can't just turn it offline and redo stuff because there's still more fresh data coming in. So they're trying to get a handle on what they can with a database and, and data entry system that was designed by people that has no documentation and there's no way to go back and find out what they can about it. So that it's, it's kind of a reverse engineering <laughs> data program while it's running. So it's like jumping in a car and then looking in the engine compartment while you're back down the highway and then an hour. So they can't stop and, and fix it, so they're trying to fix it while in motion. And so um, there's only certain limitations they can do to kind of, kind of fix things. So for right now, they've said, you know, if you really have missing chunks of data, we have to do it in one week periods. Because if one, uh, if there's 288 data points a day that's on there. So 10 days of data is 2,800 points. And I think it's somewhere between 2,000 and 2,500 is where the, where the website chokes right now. So you've got to kind of keep it below that. So uh, moving on, um, so I think I've gotten through most of the updates. This is sort of just going to be an intro to my going on my computer and walking through all the different monitor stuff. But this is one thing to just remember that station owners and anyone who has the login, you can go in here on the monitor site and log in. Um, Generally, this is sort of the format of the name, and then this is the default password, unless the owner goes in, unless someone goes in and changes the password. Um, 
An important point here, though, is that you don't need to log in to view the data. This is often misunderstood. It's a totally open website to look at the data. The only thing that logging in allows you to do is just to edit the main details page to put in information about the station and to do the data upload, to upload the SD card files. So that's um, really the only reasons why you would need to log into the site. But nonetheless, it's good to just know that. Okay. Um, so we've sort of, we've already talked about this quite a bit already. Um, so again, it's the historic data um, that we're concerned about uploading. If it's gone to 4G, then you're going to be having generally data go up. And if you have 4G, it also means that, you're, that your station will have been reprogrammed and it should just be a drag and drop of the file. Whereas with historic data, you actually need to format the headers. So it's kind of a manual formatting using these UUIDs, universally unique identifier. So you, your site and the parameters at your site get assigned a UUID and that um, will allow put that in the file headers and that will allow it to link up with the parameters as they are listed on the website. Um, so this is pretty much the same stuff. Sending data directly to monitor my watershed or uploading micro SD card files. As I mentioned, filling gaps, or if they haven't been online, you're just uploading in order to get the data online. So th this is a um, file that's been formatted and that can be uploaded. Um, there's basically four points, and you don't even, like these non-bold things, you don't actually even need to upload in order for the upload to be successful. You just need to get the sampling feature UUID and have that colon and then put in this, this UUID. Put in this header and then put in these associated UUIDs for each of these particular parameters. That will link these to the parameters on the site. And then you have to have this exact header. And again, this isn't the only slide that addresses this. So I'll be referencing it again, and it'll be in the presentation for later. Um, UTC minus five indicates that it's EST, that this is an EST. And then this, the formatting of the dates, often these historic files are formatted differently than, than this, so you have to go in and you actually have to type in this. Um, in one of the later slides. I'll get, I'll get to it. But um, you do this in Excel, and it's a custom formatting of this column where you just type this actual um, formatting in. Don't worry, Jacqueline, there's other information. Uh, David, just one question. Yeah. You, didn't, you didn't mention this. Now, we're editing the text file or, in, or importing the data into Excel and then editing the headers in Excel. So, it, you're gonna, and uh, th there's directions in here about that, but it's, you're opening it in Excel and formatting in Excel, okay. and then you're saving it as a CSV. Okay. And then if you're breaking it up, and this is, I talk about this in detail in some of the later slides, but if you're breaking it up into chunks, it's better to open the CSV in Notepad right. and do it from there, because Excel will go and reformat these yeah. every time, yeah. from back from this format because it tries to make decisions for you. Yeah. But if you do it in Notepad, it won't do that. Okay. So some of the, that's a good question, and it really gets into some <coughs> of the hassles of sort of finagling the system as it currently is. So uh, when you go in and you log in, see I'm logged in here, and then these tabs come up. So you can press this tab. This is, this is uh, Pickering Creek. Uh, this is one of Mike Bullard's stations in the Pickering Creek watershed. But you go in and you press that, and then this information comes up. And it has this, the sampling feature UUID here, 
which is that. Oops. And then these are your individual UUIDs that would go in here. So you just basically copy them out and put them in there. Okay. They're all, these UUIDs are also further down on the page associated with these sparkline plots. If you just click on that, it automatically copies it. You don't have to press right click and click copy or anything like that. If you just click it, left click it, it automatically copies it. So that's another way to get the UUIDs. Um, so that's the historic upgrade. Um, as we mentioned, these 4G upgrades are happening. Um, when that's happening, as we've mentioned, those those boards are also being reprogrammed to format the files so that they'll automatically be uploadable without having to do that that header uh, reformatting. I have a question. Sure. Um, so do you, do you guys have a timeline? Like are they all 4G by now? Or is there, is there um, a staggering of information? Like it's pretty staggering? much we're just going according to, you know, which stations seem to be like being used the most and which okay. ones are kind of higher profile in terms of groups that are really making use of them, uh, stations that have really particularly useful information coming off of them, um, or just, yeah. you know, like any other miscellaneous reason. Um, so if I get the SAD card and it, and it says, you know, like, will I be able to tell where the 4G starts and the... Well, you, you'll be, when, like for Hosensack, it yes. hasn't been upgraded yet. So okay. if that happens, you'll yeah. know. And then at that point, you'll just know it's been upgraded to 4G. Because we have to re-establish the, the, you know, account and, right. you know, make sure that there's money in there and all that. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and not all of them need to be upgraded to 4G. If there's right. sufficient 2G signal there, then we That's, that station got last year, yeah. that station got a little bit kind of that there were some issues with the folks that were Jim was having some right. you know knee replacement stuff and wasn't able to be on it and, um, so I think the plan at this point is probably to just go out and replace the SIM card there and just okay. redo it because it seem, it doesn't seem like we're getting the sort of things lined up to be able to continue with that current SIM card because of some issues with the two different accounts that it's apparently listed under or something. It's, so, no one really knows, and the easiest thing I think Shannon thinks is just go out and replace the SIM card anyway. You would replace the SIM card, and then, um, but hopefully, you know, all of the data, that one is a fairly sunny spot, so the battery should be good, and it should, uh, the last time when I was there, I removed the uh, cellular power cord, so it wasn't using power to, to um, try to contact the cell phone. Mm. So, so it, and it will continue working for you know thousands of years because it's got a solar panel. So the, the data card will hold close to two thousand years of data. So there's no you know there's we should still have computer data from the last year even though there was no online data. So I'll when I go back uh, we'll put in a new card that is being paid and then it should come back online. And at the same time I'll upgrade the logger code to have the correctly formatted headers. Um, so. Every station that's out there, whether it's 2G, 4G, or no cellular at all, is all going to have the new formatted data file card stuff mm -hmm. as I get to them. Okay. It's just, you know, a lot of stations, are, they're working fine, they're online, uh, everything's great, the sensors are working good, so it's not a super high priority for me to get to them. The kind of visit the ones that either lost cellular, never had it, or have a sensor failure that we need to address really soon. So those stations that are still doing fine and have been doing fine all along are a little bit further down on the list, but we're okay. definitely going to get to the same problem. Thank you. Sign. Yeah, so I sent, like, I don't know when that was, maybe in September or something. I sent all the data. At that point, I sent it out by email. So uh, hopefully that's okay. Right? Uh, yeah, you sent it to uh, Katie. Oh, well, for the Hosen Sack crew. Oh, oh, sorry, um, sorry. With Jackie, like, uh, when get her, you know, get her up and running again. Mm -hmm. So at that point, I sent the data out. Right. I don't know if you've done anything since. Well, 
No, no, so that's not expected yeah, that's at this right. point. I mean, that's yeah. sort of for folks that are willing to deal with these sort of these formatting issues and stuff yeah. like that. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So, so here's the directions as they stand for for doing this um, data upload thing and formatting old files. Um, this is where we get into the directions. Um, I don't. We're at 11.25 right now. I don't think I want to specifically go through these. I'm just going to flip through just to give folks an idea. But, but I think we should probably get started on just the monitor tutorial. But this is what you were getting at, Bob. You just right. open the file in Excel. This is often what you, you know, like Simon, what you would see with just a file that is just downloaded from the SD card. It's not, it hasn't been formatted for upload to monitor. You know, this, this was before Monitor was even functioning, that this code was on this station. So you see the slashes there, which you can't have. You see there's no UUIDs here. So this is just the way it comes off the SD card. So then you go, you insert three rows at the top. Add these exact words, including punctuation and bold below. Add those three things. Log into Monitor My Watershed with username and pass and go to the site. This is when you're getting to these tabs where you can edit and look at the UUIDs. Click View Token UUID List. Click View Token UUID List. And then you, so, and then you, this is what comes up. That's the, that's the same one that I showed earlier that had the bolded. So your feature ID here and then the, the individual parameter UUIDs here. You can copy that out. So you copy that, you copy this, sampling feature ID, put it right after that. And then you do the same thing with these, insert them in this row above the corresponding parameters. Do this date time formatting. This is the image I was talking about before this custom formatting. So you go to format cells in Excel and then do custom and then just type that in. Mm -hmm. And then it takes it, then it allows you to convert from, it automatically converts from that to that. Mm -hmm. Save as a CSV file, open the CSV in Notepad, and then delete enough records so that it's about one week of data. Okay. Otherwise, if it wasn't one week, you'd be done at that point. Once you've converted to CSV, then you could upload. But at that point, you have to break it up, and you want to do it in Notepad because of that, that annoying Excel Smart feature. Mm -hmm. And then just save as with a new name, you know, to indicate the range that you're going to have. And then you're going to have multiple files with different date ranges. Continue that process of making the, those different one-week CSV files and then just begin uploading those to monitor. Um, that's just a ways to know that you're logged in. Logged in here shows you. Um, and then you're going to go, when you're ready to upload those files, you're going to go down to manage sensors, which is just about midway down on this main site details page. You're going to click that button, and then at the bottom of that page, there's going to be this, upload a data file with a paper clip. So you're going to click that, you're going to go and get your file, and then you're going to press that button there. That button will appear once you've brought that file in, you're going to press that button, and it's, it's again, this is, this is a new thing, it's kind of beta, there will be... <laughs> a successful tab that will pop up if it's successful. Once you press that, it's not gonna, there's not gonna be a spinning wheel or anything. It's just gonna sit there until a success tab pops up. But the sex, su success tab will only pop up for, what do you think it is, Shannon? Two seconds? Three seconds? <laughs> so, yeah, so it's like, I mean, 
Now, of course, if you're unsure, it, it will start appearing. Like uh, the next couple slides, you can trouble, you know, you can sleuth it and see that the data are in there. But as far as like giving you an explicit notification, pretty super quick. There will also, if it'll run, if it ends up running pretty long, it's pretty much guaranteed that it's not going to be successful, and it may just be too big. Um, and a tab will pop up that'll say it it failed. Um, these are ways to just sort of confirm that the data are there once you've uploaded them. So there's this tab which downloads all the data for that station that's on monitor. That'll produce an Excel file. Um, so the red here is uh, is is are, are going to appear as soon as the upload is successful. So this underneath these spark line plots, it'll have the most recent observation. These in blue will not be available. They kind of updated, like I guess it's the top of the hour. So some, the, the data will not be visualizable, that is graphable, right away. I mean, unless you just happen to do it like a minute before the top of the hour, but I think it's the top of the hour that these things update. So you may have to wait a while until the data are viewable, but this will appear immediately after successfully uploaded. Mm -hmm. These will be blank. Someone? No, oh. I, no I just was <coughs> looking at the data, um, and I know this is really picky, but your UTC offsets have been adjusted for data savings time. Correct. It's always, it's always, it's always minus five. yeah. So actually that's not correct in the summer. Correct, right. correct. Right. If you go online right now and look at the station that's online, it'll say that the last data point was received at 10.30 a.m. Right. Because yeah. that's five right. hours from UTC. That's the subtleties of this data stuff. So for you know, six I mean, or seven months out of the year, the website looks like it's wrong by an hour. Right. So coming up in two weeks, it's not going to be a problem. <laughs> It's a that's it's a great point, and you'll see when we do the basic thing. Well, we also have stations all over the world that are sending data, and we can't easily have no. I
somebody else had been in this data system and told us, here's how to format your data, and uh, we're, we're kind of limited as to how we can do that. I'm just, I'm just glad that this website functions right now, because I think we've been telling you guys for like two years that this website will be up and running any day now, and so there's been so many bugs and issues and things that they've worked through that I'm just glad that it's up most of the time. There was now there's a couple of days ago, so we may notice about 24 hours from now the graphs would work. And so there's still a lot of people working behind the scenes to make the website work. So we're just glad that it's working most of the time and we're able to see the data. Um. First thing you do for 
working in monitor my watershed. Go to monitor my watershed. Not <laughs> ORG. Okay. So, uh, unfortunately, I think this is not showing exactly how it's going to appear on your screen. It's kind of missing some stuff because of this reduced thing with the projector. Normally, these will be at the top. Yeah, so I don't know why it's... Usually those will be displayed up here. Um, so we're going to go to... I'm just going to... So I'm, I'm actually logged in right now, so it shows my sites. I'm going to log out, though. Um, so that is helpful to see, because when you're actually checking your site and using your phone to actually check that you're cleaning stuff, that is helpful. I will log out for now, though, just to demonstrate. something with having a truck plugged into this projector. All right, well, I'll stay logged in. So you're not going to have my sites if you're not logged in. So you can either go to Browse Sites or Time Series Analyst. I'm going to go to Browse Sites first, and I'm going to come back to this just to show what the difference is. I'll go to Browse Sites, and you get a display of all the sites all over. You can see Shannon mentioned they're here and there all over. Most of them. <clears throat> the highest density are here in the Delaware Basin. So within this site, you've got data types here. Um, moving forward, there is, this is not necessarily going to be exclusive to the Enviro DIY sensor stations. There is going to be opportunity to put, to put other data out there in the future. So this leaf pack data are benthic macroinvertebrate data. Theoretically, you can put, in, you know, as this evolves, you put whatever data you want on there. Um, then you've got organizations here, so the organizations that own the sites. And then you've got site types here. to go in here and we'll go to anyone want to go to a particular site? Let's see. Why don't we go to one of the manor sites? We'll type in here so it brings up manor, the manor Creek site. So we'll click on this one. So you click on the site and you go into view data for this site. brings up this site page. Now again, I'm logged in and I can access any one site. So there's this tab here and this tab here and this tab here, which wouldn't be there if you weren't logged <coughs> in on a particular station. But you can see that you have the station owner is Kent Himmelwright. He's the Berks County Conservation District um, uh, watershed specialist. You can see when it was uh, registered this deployment date is when it was um, upgraded. Yeah, that's when I upgraded the last Friday. Yep. And obviously you have a map here. It's location, you have the coordinates, you've got an elevation, some additional information. And then this is was added in by hand. This is the Stroud Logger 107. And then here you have um, so that's what SL stands for. Yes. Stroud SL stands for yep. SL stands for Stroud Logger. Back um, about eight or nine years ago when I was in Stroud, we were um, coming up with uh, letter and number designations for a lot of different parts of it. And so following again some model that some other institution used so that our system was compatible with them, you use the first two letters of the manufacturer, and then you have um, uh, some other number to go back to. And there was already an SW and there was already Anyway, there were other letters that we were not able to choose because of the compatibility, so we decided to call 
they just have to be called that, but that's just what we call it. So you can see that this one was put out a while ago. There's been quite a few that have been put out since then. Um, since I'm logged in, you can see this here is the, the sampling feature UUID. Um, and we come down here to the actual uh, data display options. So this tab here, um, I'll press that, and you'll see how it works with the Wi-Fi here. This can take a little bit. But that's going to download all the data for that site. And it'll, it'll download all the different parameters. Um, this will just download from when this station was put online. Wow. So, so this so one is recent. You will, and it can take a long time to save this. Now, this went quick because it's only been out for a couple of weeks, or it's only been online for a couple of weeks. So this is what the format will look like for those files. So you've got this information, associated information, parameters, and then you've got the actual data. Now, Michael, um, this is where I was mentioning about the times. You've got both timestamps. Okay, so you've got the, the EST indicated by the time offset of five hours, and then you've got the UTC. So EST is five hours behind UTC. And then you've got all of your parameters, and then and it's just data every five minutes. Okay? So we go back to going through the other tabs. Again, this is the tab that you would use to upload um, files. I won't go into that right now. This is the time series analyst. So if you press this tab, it will bring up all of the parameters for that station in the visualization feature on the site here. So you see these are all the different parameters for that site that you could potentially grab. So we've got manner site clicked on here. Um, these are all the different parameters, the sensor parameters as well as battery, as well as temperature of the mayfly door, and as well as these two uh, cellular information parameters. Um, once you're at this page, there's various things you can do. You can plot other sites. So you can press this, and these are all the sites that are all around. These are all the sites that you saw on the map there. So if we click another one, if we click Pine Creek, for instance, it brings in all the parameters for Pine Creek as well. So then you could overlay parameters from Pine Creek and Manor Creek. We're not going to do that right now. Um, so I'm going to click that off. That will bring them in. And below that, below the sites, um, you've got what just happened there. Hold on. Look at the numbers um, in the circles on the right there. What's that? One, two. Here? No, no, to the left, to the left in the left uh, field. Go all the way to it says one, it says, are those data points? One? Yeah. Oh, those are, there's like, for instance, turbidity, <coughs> there are two turbidity values. There's the low and there's the high. Okay. You know about that, Jacqueline, right? Okay. So here's the, here's the parameters over here. Um, you click them here, it'll reduce it over here. This is, I, I'm just going through this. There, there's some subtleties to how you work this, and there's a lot of different um, <coughs> ways in to visualization. So you get all the parameters displayed for a particular site if you click this main time series analyst tab. Okay? If you come down here and click this time series analyst tab, it's only going to bring in the data that are indicated in this particular sparkline plot or panel. So there's these different panels. So here's conductivity, here's water depth, here's temperature, here's turbidity, here's the other turbidity, <coughs> battery voltage, that's an important one to monitor. This one looks good, it's at four. And you've got temperature, and that is the temperature of the logger itself. 
as opposed to the temperature in the water. And then you've got this cell information, and then you've got this final temperature. See, this is actually, this is actually labeled wrong. Yep, I'll fix it. Yeah, so Shannon can log in and fix that. Fix that. Um, so, you see, this is the other temperature of the actual sensor temperature, that's water temperature. So, if we go up here to conductivity, now, this is the way here with the time series, the download, and the uh, 72 hour table. This is the display that will be normal. This is just showing up like this because of the connection to the projector here. But if we, so why don't we go over here and I'll click water depth and we'll see where that takes me. So it takes you in. The, off, the default is to display a month of data. Okay, you've got water depth here. You've got date and time here. It's again, it's displayed in UTC. That's fortunate by some people's standards, very unfortunate by other people's standards. Um, as we saw, when you download the data though, you do have both timestamps. This is a feature here in Monitor where you can scroll here. Here's kind of a quirky, buggy thing where ideally you wouldn't have this cover up here. You can't see actually what's underneath there. So ideally there's a you know way to see all those parameters at one time, but it kind of covers them up. And then you do that and then you can see. Okay, so, but these are five, meter, five minute increments as you go along, you can see the value and the date and the time. Another feature here with the graphing is I'm using my mouse uh, little scroll wheel. I'm pulling back on it right now and reducing this axis. Okay? Now I'm pushing forward on the mouse wheel. We can do that on the pad. I personally just don't use my pad. I don't function very can do that on the pad too. Same with down here. Um, except down here, if you're scrolling via, see these crosshairs? They go on like this. So if I want to zoom in on this peak, I go like this. And then you can reduce that. Now if I click off, then it has this, you get this double arrow here, so you can kind of close it. Okay? What you can also do to look at different data ranges is adjust here. You have the auto, auto tabs here, look at all the data last month or last week, or you can just type in dates. So if we plot all, and you see, so this was only, so actually it was only it was only put out in August, October 11th, so we're actually just getting, that's all we're able to get, so last month is all of it. So if we do last week, so this is that range from like Wednesday. Yeah, and actually we're still. It's only been what, what day is it today? Eighteen. So last Friday. Yeah. So if we, so you can adjust here. So if we do two days worth, we'll do we'll do the sixteenth to the eighteenth. So you can put it in there, and we'll adjust that way too. Now there are some bugs in terms of sometimes when you're scrolling this axis, for instance, it won't. Respond right now. It's nice because it's responding directly to my mouse. Sometimes there's a hesitation, and you have to scroll like one or two and see how much it's done. You know, I'm just sort of trying to mention this type of stuff just so you understand that it's a work in progress. And um, I'll get to submitting bugs and submitting feature requests, which we encourage <coughs> folks to do as you're working with this. Please go in and submit bugs as you know, and submit, submit feature requests as you think of, oh, this would be nice to have. Please go in and do that. Um, there's two different ways to do that, via Google Form or via GitHub. Okay, so if we go back to the main tab, the main details page, we've also got these three other tabs here. So 
this one is doing this, this tab here is doing the same thing as this tab, except it's just doing it for this parameter. So if we press that, it will do the same thing, produce an Excel spreadsheet. Up, similar looking, but you've just got the one column of data here. Okay. So with a short time frame like this, it, it's gone pretty quick. Um, I think if there's a lot of data, you might download it a, qu a little quicker, just <coughs> one parameter at a time. Regardless, that's a way where you and you get both timestamps here. So if you're going out and doing QC and that type of thing, and you just need you know, times to match up with when you did things. These, this is a good way to do it, to just scroll down and find the time you need. Okay. Okay. This uh, tab here is a 72 hour table that just immediately pops up. Um, it's I've yet to find this super useful. Um, if, if you just want to, if you just want a kind of immediate look at recent data, you can use this. Um, but this, as far as I know, I think this particular timestamp is the UTC timestamp. Um, unless this was changed, the way it's displayed right now. Um, That's, uh, yeah, so it's in UTC right now, because it's saying it's, um, it's saying it's uh, three, four. So this is in UTC, so if you're trying to use it to match up with current times that you're at a station or something like that, this isn't necessarily going to be that useful, unless you're super comfortable with doing these, you know, back calculations of time zones. But nonetheless, it's there. There is description of, of using these things in the quality control quick guide as well. So we scroll down, um, you know, the, these ones here are just the actual water parameters that we're measuring. Um, we can go into to just this more in the afternoon if we want to look at data and practice overlaying variables. Maybe we'll get to that Day, but I want to go through just the main functioning of this. Um, battery voltage was just right there just to see this, this battery voltage pattern. There's a lot of pattern recognition with all this, where um, you know, as you become comfortable with the data, you'll be able to just go in and look, and without even really looking at numbers, you just see a pattern and you can identify is this the way it's supposed to be? Is something wrong? This looks good. There's a daily decline and then a recharge at night. Okay, this is it's going down a little bit, probably due to Shannon can comment. Yeah, probably the last two days and probably so they're never really charged all day. Yeah. But this is also we're also losing sun. we're also losing light too. Mm -hmm. But no, that was mainly due to the last two days being cloudy. Yeah. So um The water temperature? Yeah, water temperature, sure. Because I didn't be here this afternoon on this. Sure, sure. sure. Um, has there ever been any consideration given to, to a second set of data points that would identify the max temperature for cold water fisheries so we had a comparison? Um, that is certainly something that would be a useful feature. I think we're pretty far off from that because that's sort of like the application of the data to ecological concepts and we're not even to the point of like, you know, the, the website itself even functioning how it ideally would, you know, in terms of like this upload yeah. issue and that type of thing. Um, there's certainly ways that you can do that on your own with yeah, regard sure. to, you know, some R programming like Rob Tuttle with Kim's Nature Conservancy groups to do it, to do it for alerts and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, but that that certainly is something though, Bob, that you could put in for the records as a feature request 
in this monitor my watershed portal. This is the beginning stages of this thing, so presumably it's going to be developing for you know, an indefinite future. Okay. So you can certainly go in and, and uh, do that. But if you, I mean, you it's, it's, it's kind of silly. I do it's silly to do it manually because you know, I do it right. so you just put in the, the range yeah, you know, in the R for my visualization. Right. Sure. And that's what it occurs to me. I'm more so much concerned about the Yeah, it's possible. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, but yeah, I would think that they'd be able to have that in. Or you could download the data file and do some sort of lookup in that feature in Excel. You could find it. It looks like Shannon is wanting to. I wanted to point out a couple things while you have this graph. Sure. Right now, it just turned 12 o'clock, but. Hover your mouse data over the very last data point in the graph. So if you look there, uh, hold on, let me zoom in. Probably there. 3:40 p.m. SUTC time. Um, so the graphs that you see here are actually a little bit delayed from mm -hmm. what is in the real database. So if you go back one page now, Dave, to the to the main data. So yeah. So see, it says. That was like if you hit the hit the reload button. <coughs> All right. So now the last point that it has was from 11 o'clock. That's 11 o'clock standard time, so which is yeah. right now. So that log group was transmitted probably 10, 20 seconds ago, right? So the latest point right now. Uh, okay. See so over at Turbidity, it says 10.10082. 10, uh, okay. Let's say you're at the station right now and you're picking it up and it's really muddy and everything. All of a sudden that the next reading at 11.05 will probably say turbidity is like 200 or something, right? a really high value. But if you look at that chart right there, the line will still be going flat because they don't actually plot a new graph until um, the half hour period. So you gotta wait till 12.30 on the phone or 11.30 water. Right? At that point, then you'll see that a few minutes ago, there was just, so it's a little bit of a hassle, especially if you're storm chasing, and you're waiting to see, hey, is there a peak in connectivity so I can go grab a sample? The graphs don't match up like they do with the text that's in the chart right there. Those of you who've used the old um, um, GreenHost website, it was instantaneous. Whatever was heard from the logger was put in the graph. And so if you did something in the water or an event was happening, you saw it instantly in the chart. But on this website, the charts are behind. And it's because there are three separate databases right now, there's a database that has text, there's a database that has these spark plot, spark plot line plots, and a database that does big time series analyst thing. And they can't, or at least right now, they don't interact super frequently or the server bogs down. So right now, they only coordinate every half hour. And that's why the text is always correct and up to date, but the charts are always half hour behind. So and they're very aware of that, and that's something that they're trying to fix, but it's just something to be aware of if you're out in the field and you're wondering why the charts aren't matching up with the numbers that are underneath them. And it's also hard because of these spark lines, there's no scale. Like you see there was a big peak in turbidity <coughs> last night, but we don't know, did it, right now it's at 10, but did it go from 10 to 20 or 10 to 100? I don't know. You've got to open up the full time series plot <coughs> of that and then see what the peak was. And so I'm hoping at some point to put some scale on that left hand axis to give you an idea on these spark lines what the magnitude of these changes is, and also update the charts every five minutes along with the data. And that's something that they're working on, but it's just something to be aware of when you look at this. Because even I forget sometimes, because when we were at the site the other day, we turn it on, we're transmitting data, and then it still says no data to display in the graph until a half hour goes by. And then you see it fills in you know, six points from the last half hour and puts it on there. So it's just something to be aware of when you're looking at, the, uh, at these charts. That's a great point. Luckily, when you open this on your phone, it's not necessarily going to be super easy to look at this stuff, but these actually do show up pretty nice on your phone. So that can often be the key when you're out at the site of the phone and you want a recent value, you can go here. Um, yeah, I didn't have any trouble with it, honestly, with the last two installations using the phone. The path on this site was fine, so with the copy out that um, you grabbed somewhere. So that's the basic. Uh, deal with what happens. So I'm going to go back to this main site. Like before, I'm going to show you one quick thing while you have this up. So let's say you want to go to Kim's site. And I didn't realize 
this until just you know, a couple days ago. Um, you can type in, like right now, type in, um, well, the first of this one is down here, SL154. You can go in the search box and type SL154, and that takes you to that station. Mm -hmm. But let's say you can't remember, you know that Kim's got a bunch of stations somewhere. Go up to the search box and just type Kim. Mm -hmm. And now it zooms into all six of the five stations. <laughs> and um, I did another one just segment of who else? Um, Kent. Type in Kent. And uh, you actually get the three Kent Kimmel rights, and then there's also some guy over in Ohio who happens to be named. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, if, if you can't remember your station, it's, it'll, if you know if you go to one of the stations they showed you earlier, um, it had station owner, creek name, um, station name, any of that kind of stuff. All of those things that show up in the station list are searchable by the, you're not just searching by ID name or something. It's just anything that's in there. So you could search the word Durkin or any or manner, or Burks, or North conservation, North or North any North of those North words North that you see there. I usually get EA in there, and nobody comes up with East Cobb, right. which one of the ones. Right, yeah, so, so as long as that word is in your description somewhere up in there, of your name or something, or down in the notes field, that notes thing can be a paragraph. You can mm -hmm. update that to whatever you can say. You know, I usually put the SL log in there <coughs> just for my records, but if you want to go in and add something, that's fine, and then you can search that very easily in that drop down. So it makes it really handy for finding your station or someone else's station. If you know someone on uh, Pike <coughs> Creek or uh, Mill Creek or whatever, you type the word Mill in there, and then you'll see that we've got a whole bunch of Mill Creeks because they're all over. It's that very generic name, but it's just you can use that to help narrow down the creek if you can't remember the name. It's really handy for finding your site that way. Good. So um, moving down these tabs, so this is another way to access visualize the data. It's kind of a, it's just a different way. I'm, I'm entirely sure why there's this extra option, but just to, just to show what happens when you click that tab. It's going to give you a little bit of a different looking map. It's the same site, which, and this is presumably something that, that will uh, evolve over time, but just zooming in in the same way, and you can click on these, and it'll spread out the sites, and it, it's the same feature, it just sort of looks different, it'll bring you in to this same screen, okay? So this is where I mentioned it's just there's a lot of different ways to go about accessing the site data here, okay? So that's where we're now. Let's go to the help tab. Just want to go to that so that we can be super clear on what to do if you find something that seems buggy or you have a feature request that you just want to put in there, whether they get to it soon or not, who knows? Right. But it's at least in there. And I would definitely encourage folks to do that. Particularly for bugs, set up a GitHub account. You go in there and actually enter into the GitHub account. That's what uh, the designers, the folks that are working on the infrastructure are referencing most often um, to do that. So there is a link here to GitHub, but if you go down to Monitor My Watershed and then view Help Resources, there's going to be a variety of different resources here for help. Here's the tab that I showed earlier in the presentation about uploading. Data, but then if you go down here to the bottom, still need help, you can submit any bugs or feature requests via this contact form, which is simply a Google form. Um, or, oops, or you can go here to GitHub. And it'll direct you to this particular location and then you can search on issues. So if you have a, you know, uh, you say uh, temperature limit as something. So that has no issue that's been there. So you might start a new issue at that point and then just comment however you like. And then that will stay in there as an issue until it is marked as resolved by the folks who are managing the database. Alright? So, close 
out of that. Like that. And um, I think that's all we need to go over. This is something that is just for me when I'm logged in, so I probably shouldn't even be going to talk about that. Um, okay, what else here is on my list? Um, I've gotten through the main things I wanted to touch on. Um, are there any questions at this point? Richard. Just as a rule of navigation wise, do you find yourself using the back arrow or should you be able to? You know? I do obviously use it at times. I mean, I think there's some, you know, kind of, you, you just need to go in there and just kind of figure out like how it works. Um, I think I, I I'm, not, so I'm not playing it to be like the grand, you know, whatever knowledge holder person on how to function best with the monitor in my water. I obviously have used the back button at times. But sometimes you definitely don't want to do this. But yeah, no, I don't think there's any real issue. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you're never really losing. You can always just go back in and, re, and sort of reduce okay. it. Sometimes if you're overlying plots on one another, you know, you kind of want to watch that. But And you can see the new tabs do open, so you can go back and forth. Right. You know, and open new tabs and look at different sites. Um, Sometimes on sites, so if you find yourself doing that, you're missing something. But in this case, I'm probably not. I don't think so. Okay. Jan, Rachel, <coughs> any? No, it shouldn't be Yeah. Okay. Um, so, are there any other questions at this point about just the, just the basic functionality here? If not, we can we can either have some lunch or we can go in and just plot some more variable plot sites on one another and just demonstrate that. There's some subtleties with that that certainly wouldn't be bad to know about. Any other questions? Now, why don't we go in and we'll just do some plotting of variables just to, anyone have any particular sites or conditions they want to look at? We can go back to Manor, I guess, and just sort of, we can plot multiple Manor sites on one another. This is one of the kind of just a little bit, this is obviously something that is probably going to change in the future, but the color scheme of the variables depends on when you bring them in. So if you want water depth to be blue, bring it in first. <laughs> yeah, so ideally you would be able to adjust those colors, you know, just however you want it. So there's blue. So if we go here to this, oh, so this is good. I didn't demonstrate these. So, well, I guess I did, but, um, all right. So we've got Manor Creek. So we'll go down and bring in another variable for Manor. So here's all your variables. We can show all of them. And let's bring in the next thing maybe we want to bring in is conductivity, okay? So that, you can see when you click on it here, it brings it over to this spot, but it's not clicked on yet. <coughs> Click that on, and then we go back to visualize, and there's your plot. So that's actually kind of interesting. Manor got some sort of pulse there during that storm. Two of them, actually, during that storm. And then it dilutes. There's something that flushed in during that storm. Okay. Um, so if we go back to data sets, we've got those two here. Those two are listed here. You can also, uh, you can take them out via these X's here. You can also see, I didn't point this out before, but here's some summary statistics. And I believe these change as you, so let's see, so 102.7. Yeah, so let me see here. 
So it will change the summary statistics according to the range that you have in there. Okay, so that's a you know that that's a site by site method that you could use to look at uh, different summary statistics. Um, so if we go back to data sets, one thing quirky thing. But sites searchable? Because that was one thing I was looking at too. Right? Yeah. The map sites on Down the here. left side there. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great point. Thank you, Paul. That was one thing I wanted to point out. Ideally, there would be some official search method here built in. But what you can do is just the standard Control F, mm -hmm. and then search like that. So okay. if I search for another Manor site, okay. we can go up and we can bring in two okay. other Manor sites. Okay. Okay. So. And that's a good transition to bringing in multiple sites. Okay, so I brought those in, and since I already had conductivity and depth turned on, it brought in conductivity and depth for those other two stations. So if I click, if I try to click all of them on, what's going to happen is that the sixth is not going to be clickable. Mm -hmm. That's another subtle um, feature here: is that your max number of variables that you can turn on and visualize at a time is five. All right? Ideally, you know, I guess ideally you might be able to do more than that, but that's the limit right now. So if I just do conductivity, if I click off depth, the depth is relative, so comparing depths among sites is has, I guess, somewhat limited utility. You can certainly look at flashiness to some extent via clicking depth, and we can look at that in a second. Um, conductivity is a nice comparison between sites. So we've clicked three on, all three sites on for conductivity, and we'll see how it looks. Um, I've still got the 17th and 18th on, I'm going to do all, and press plot again, and we'll see conductivity. Um, so we've got three conductivities for the three sites there. We've got Manor Creek Brown property, which is the uh, furthest up site on Manor Creek itself, furthest upstream site on Manor Creek itself. We've got an unnamed tributary to Manor Creek, which is upstream of the Brown property, correct? Richard, yes. And then we've got at the Durkin property, these are farmers in the area um, whose property uh, these stations are located. Um, this is the furthest downstream. So, so there's, yeah, so there's spikes going all the way up to 700 or so um, at the furthest downstream site. And if we zoom in, so this is, we're just sort of doing investigation right now. If we zoom in, Yeah, so let's, we saw we got a little bump there in the, at the tributary. So this is the type of thing, this is why data stuff takes a while, because you see each one of these, you can kind of just delve in and see, well, what time was it happening? How high did it go? Was it related to anything else? So my inclination right now is to go back here and uh, bring in, bring back in depth um, for, see this is the site, so I don't know which site it is. I guess it's, well let's go back, I'm going to go back and see which site the green one is. It's uh, 7S. So we go in here and let's bring in depth for 7S. there. 
Um, but that may just be in relation to time of day. Is that possible? It's subtle that sensor? Because it's, yeah. Well, that's a good question. That's a good question. And, and what, so this is what some folks have been doing lately, is when you have this type of thing happen, you need, and you want to start figuring out, well, what's actually happening, you try to identify the time that it's happening. So it seems to be happening. You know. So what you want to do to just make sure that it's not just to get a first-hand look at it is go out during that time with a handheld meter that you calibrated and just measure. Mm -hmm. And do that as a cross-check, just quality control, and make sure that there's nothing wacky going on with the station. It doesn't appear to be wacky data. It appears to be real. Wouldn't you agree, Shannon? Consistent. Yeah, so we've had two stations out of almost 300. Um, well, I said maybe about 200. 200 stations that have CTD sensors on them. And I think two out of all of those in the last five years had an issue where there would be a brief spike in conductivity for about 20 minutes, but only uh, between the hours of 7.30 and 8 o'clock in the morning on a sunny day. Uh, it had to do with the some sort of interference with the solar charging circuitry on the Mayfly that was feeding into the, the CTD sensor. So I've never seen one that lasts quite that long. So we've had multiple places where we've gone out there and taken a, re a reading and actually watched it get really salty um, because of something that's upstream, like a water softener or something else that's flushing into the creek uh, on a regular basis. So, um, so, you know, so, so that's one thing. You see unusual stuff, you know, the first thing you think of is, yeah, it's, just, it's, a, it's a good thing to think, hey, is my sensor not functioning? Because we've had people read way too much into a bad sensor and go, hey, you know, the, the water's, you know, 30 feet deep here right now. Well, no, this good your sensor is broken. And so when you go out and you see, well, I've only got six inches of water, why is it saying 30 feet? So don't read too much into the data without first saying, is the data, is the sensor bad or not? Um, so the other thing we can look at is, <coughs> If you can plot the uh, CTD temperature of 7S, and, uh, and also the battery voltage. <coughs> okay. um, because the CTD sensor puts out conductivity, temperature, and depth. So if we look at um, all three of the readings from that sensor, sometimes those sensors will go bad and all three readings will be bad. Other times, only one of the three will be bad because it's three separate sensors built into one of the housing, and they can sometimes um, misbehave one or two or all three at a time. So to plot all of the, the whole time. I want to click off death. Uh, red is temperature. Now see, now I brought them in differently, so conductivity now is blue. Something unusual happens when it's really cold. So the things are matching up really nicely. But it's hard to tell with only a week of data. So we'll just keep an eye on that one and see if once the sun comes out and the rain from yesterday kind of is gone and see if the trend continues. Um, but it looks to me like I really don't know. Yeah, so hard to say. You know, if you're so Richard, for instance, if Richard wanted to go out, he's being the sites that he's kind of looking after. You know, he's got a little handheld probe, so he could just go there at that time, and that would just be seeing for yourself as to if it's actually happening. And then he could, you know, if he went out there and it's high conductivity according to what's reading on the on the website, he goes out and it reads substantially lower than that, and that reads at this baseline level during that time with his handheld meter, then all he has to do is sit, you know, email Shannon, Rachel, and I and say, something's wacky going on here with the sensor. I've measured with my handheld, you know, a couple hundred units lower. There's something malfunctioning. Shannon's looking at this thinking and trying to trying to tr troubleshoot and think, yeah, is this real or is it not real? The first four days, it totally falls apart when it started raining. So I'm kind of thinking it's probably something in the water. Um, but, um, so point being though, that 
th this is why we always encourage folks to really understand the station, understand what the data looks like, understand what normal ranges are, understand the patterns that you see over time at each individual site, understand pattern recognition of, the, of just what the data looks like. And that changes throughout the year, right? Because if you look at the data for springtime and summer rains, it's going to look totally different than rain in the winter. from the axis, from the x-axis, or do you have to actually go into the raw data and like, try to find the exact uh, You mean if we zoom in super close? Yeah. Yeah, it's... Because like, you don't get the time on the... Right. On the axis. So that's another thing. So you have that, to go back to the raw data file. Well, or I do, do this hover. Yeah. Do this hover. Oh, okay. You yeah. see. Yeah. But you can see... And then see you have to correct for the uh, five hours. But that's the UTC there, yeah. so if you wanted a DST, <laughs> Then you need to go into the the. Because yeah, what if you have to, yeah, you might have to go out there at midnight or something. Right? But but that's <laughs> but that type of that type of question, Simon, yeah. is the exact type of thing that I think is good feedback for just like feature requests of this tool. Yeah. You know, over time there's going to be all kinds of things that are potentially features that could be integrated into this to make it more functional, more accessible. Yeah. You know more efficient. So I would definitely encourage everyone as you get into using this to go in there and, and do that. Because it'll it'll really show that folks are thinking about things and that the and that the, the portal is being used. And it improves it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we are at twelve twenty six here. Um, any questions on uh, the monitor my watershed function right now? Um, anything, Shannon or Rachel, that you think we should mention in the usage of monitor? We're having we're doing a recording here, so this is sort of for just anything else that is going to be important for folks viewing this recording in the future to understand and know about this um, tool. <coughs> 